Dear Family is a podcast hosted by Rachel Steinman, a writer, an educator, and a mental health advocate. And Rachel gets us up close and personal, so we feel a strong connection, familiarity, and comfort with her guests. So settle in and join us as we search for true healing and journey with Rachel and her most interesting guests. Hi, dear family and friends. Get ready for another inspirational and eye-opening story. Thank you so much for listening. And if you aren't already doing so, please subscribe and share, dear family. It means the world to me and makes all the difference. Dr. Stephen Hinshaw grew up in Columbus, Ohio with Quaker roots. He went on to attend Harvard and UCLA, becoming a professor of psychology and the department chair at UC Berkeley, in addition to becoming a professor at UC San Francisco and the vice chair. Professor Steve is an international presence in clinical psychology and mental health, whose work focuses on developmental psychopathology clinical interventions for youth, especially around ADHD, and the important work of ridding mental illness stigma. He's authored over 350 articles and chapters, plus 12 books. Steve's appeared in the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Today Show, CBS Evening News, ABC World News Tonight, CNN, and many more. He's received a Distinguished Teaching Award, a Distinguished Scientist Award, and the Distinguished Scientific Contributions to Child Development Award for his lifetime of outstanding applied psychological research. In a departure from the research writing, Professor Steve has written a very personal story, one I know you will all be touched by. It's called Another Kind of Madness, A Journey Through the Stigma and Hope of Mental Illness. And it's all about his father's recurring mental illness and the doctor-enforced silence surrounding it. Steve was awarded Best Book in Memoir Autobiography by American Book Fest. He's also the proud father of three sons, and he lives in Berkeley, California with his wife. I have a quick disclaimer about the audio quality being a bit rough because Professor Steve called in from his cell phone, but I guarantee this episode is one you're not going to want to miss. Hi, Steve. Rachel, it's great to talk. So good to talk to you. So I first came across your name when I was learning about the high rate of irritability of bipolar. And then your name came across my computer screen again when I was looking into epigenetics while working on my own family memoir. And I was pondering my family's legacy of five generations of mental illness that resulted in four suicides. So like you... I'm the child of a bipolar parent who studied psychology as an undergraduate, but whereas I went on to get my master's and my teaching credentials to teach elementary students, you became a PhD and a professor, and you're teaching and mentoring young adults. And your writing, both creative and nonfiction, and your research have been a true inspiration to me, and it's really my pleasure to have you on Dear Family, so thank you so much for being here. I appreciate the invitation. Yes, thank you so much. And right now, are you up in Berkeley? I'm in Berkeley right now. I'm curious why you think that we need to share personal stories about our family's mental illness. There's so much interest these days in reducing the stigma that is still clingingly persistent around the whole topic of mental health and mental illness. And but there's a lot of ideas about how to reduce such stigma. Well, we need to make our society and all societies more literate. We need to teach what mental health is. We need to teach what mental illness is. The problem with just factual knowledge is that if we just teach people what bipolar disorder entails or PTSD or schizophrenia or ADHD, people might become more knowledgeable of the fact, but it doesn't seem to reduce stigma. It might actually increase it because people learn the stereotypes. Contact, empathy, compassion, shared experience. These are the keys to stigma reduction. And so for me, in addition to the science I do in your kind introduction about ADHD and other mental health conditions and treatment and researching the roots of stigma, the key is disclosure. The key is 
perceived similarity. And I came to realize midway through my career that if I just kept up the science and just kept up the teaching, but didn't start to reveal why I got interested in the field in the first place, which is our family's deep experiences for many generations, just like yours with serious mental illness, I was only telling half the story. So with the talks I give in California, around the country, around the world, actually, these days, and in the writing I do, the memoir and narrative writing, not just the scientific writing, students tell me, audiences tell me, the science is essential, but storytelling and narratives and shared experience actually creates the humanity. It creates the humanization that is probably the ultimate stigma reducer. I just love that so much. It's really exactly what I'm trying to do by sharing personal stories. And I think that stories have such a powerful way of, as you said, ridding stigma because we can see the humanness and we can connect with one another and it doesn't seem so scary, right? And you don't feel so alone. All right. So your memoir, which I really enjoyed, Another Kind of Madness, it's very touching. And I know that you said that it took you a lifetime to write, which by the way, I completely understand because I'm still working on mine. But what struck me was how your family, the Hinshaw family, has so many high achieving members in addition to so many complex mental illnesses. And I would love to just hear a little bit about your memoir and about your relationship with your father, Virgil, who is also called Junior. Right. Virgil Junior was my dad's dad. Virgil Junior. Junior, a Quaker and prohibitionist. And let me start with the title of the book, Another Kind of Madness. Isn't madness kind of an archaic term for mental illness? Might it not even be stigmatizing? So a couple of years ago, as my editor, the wonderful Karen Wolney back at St. Martin's Press in New York, were debating, well, what do we call this memoir that had been so many years in the making? And a friend of mine had recommended that I look at James Baldwin's work and read Giovanni's Room. And there's a sentence in that great book in which Baldwin talks about the madness of remembering and the madness of forgetting, denying reality, or over-interpreting reality. And in that sentence, he said, and another kind of madness is, and as Karen and I were discussing this, she and I both had this realization that the other kind of madness, worse than bipolar disorder, worse than alcoholism, worse than schizophrenia, worse than PTSD, is the shame and the stigma and the denial. Because the madness of not being allowed to talk about our dad's disappearance for three months or six months or 12 months at a time when I was a boy. Didn't know if he was alive or dead. Didn't know where he was because the doctors had forbidden any mention of this. That's madness. Bipolar disorder, once it gets diagnosed, can be treated and people can enact recovery. But to have it be so shameful you can't talk about it. That's the title of the book, Another Kind of Madness. So, dad grew up in Pasadena. He was born in Chicago. His mother died of cancer when he was three. My grandfather moved the four boys out to Pasadena. We married. There were two more boys in this family. To make a long story short, in the mid-30s, when dad was 16, prohibition leaders from around the world would come to the family home. And talk around the dinner table about the Nazis and the fascists and how the isolationists in America weren't doing enough to stop this international fascist threat. And so at the summer before he turned 17, Dad couldn't sleep for a few days. He began to get preoccupied with stopping the Nazis and the fascists. Started to develop hearing the voices. And after literally spending all night walking the streets of Pasadena for three nights, had the realization that if he lifted his arms up, they'd become wings, and he could fly. And this flight would send a message to the free world's leaders to stop Hitler. Well, with hindsight, we can say, well, that was a fast-developing episode of mania, not just hypomania, but stage three mania, full delusions and hallucinations. Dad climbed to the roof of his house in Pasadena at sunrise 
the family didn't know where he was, and made his flight thinking his arms were wings. And, of course, a second later, he crashed to the pavement below the front porch, broken his wrist. He was bleeding from the head. He survived and was hospitalized for the next six months in a back ward in a public hospital in Southern California. Almost died there because he continued to believe that the Nazis had poisoned the food, the uh, cafeteria there, and went from 180 to 117 pounds. Basically given up for dead, his only treatment was being tied to his bed at night to prevent wandering. Then he spontaneously recovered the following spring. The family took him back home. There was no medication. There was no outpatient family therapy plan. This was the 30s. Mental health treatment was very primitive. And the family didn't want to ding his recovery. So they didn't want to talk about it or embarrass him. So he finished 12th grade and went on to Pasadena Junior College, as it was then called, and went on to Stanford and got all A's and became a philosopher, studying at Princeton with Albert Einstein and Bertrand Russell. Unbelievable. Until his next episode. So in our family, there's high achievement and very serious mental illness. Dad was misdiagnosed as having chronic schizophrenia for 40 years until I diagnosed him once I got out of college. But sometimes that intermixture of genius and madness inside the same person. Yeah, this is the story that Dad waited until I was 18 to tell me when I first came back to Columbus from Harvard for my first spring break. Because when my sister and I were little back at Ohio State, episode after episode, electroconvulsive therapy that he didn't need the wrong medications because no one knew how to diagnose bipolar disorder back then in the 50s. The doctor, the lead psychiatrist at the university told him, Professor Henshaw, if you tell young children about your serious mental illness and hospitalizations, they'll be permanently destroyed. You and your wife are forbidden from ever mentioning the topic. This was doctor's orders. God. The medical advice of the day was keep it quiet. So what would we think, as I write in a passage later on in the book, about an oncologist today who told the mother or father, never tell your children about your cancer. It's so destructive of an illness, they'll be permanently destroyed from that knowledge. Well, we'd sue the doctor for malpractice because the family needs to support the parent with cancer. But remember, back in the 30s and 40s and 50s and even 60s of the last century, if your aunt or grandparent died of cancer, what did you put in the obituary? Died of natural causes, died of an unspecified illness. Because cancer was such a shameful illness, everybody knew that you got cancer if you'd lost a will to live and you'd given up. It was such a shameful illness that it was highly stigmatized. Today, cancer is a cause. The NFL behemoths, one of these next few Sundays, are going to wear pink knee socks in support of breast cancer. That's right. But yeah. when did the NFL dudes wear green knee socks in support of mental health? Well, we're not there yet. Cancer has been destigmatized, especially in the case of breast cancer, because women have spoken up and told their stories. We're not there yet. When I was a boy, mental illness was deemed to be so shameful that the mention of it would poison the children. Yeah. What do we know now about when something's going wrong in a family, but nobody talks about it? What does the child do? The child has two choices, right? Number one, think the world's an awful, cruel, random place, not a very happy or healthy attribution. Or number two, as I did, maybe it's my fault. Maybe I'm not a good enough son. Maybe I shouldn't ask any question when dad comes back six months later and I haven't known where he's been. At least if you internalize, there's some control. But that control comes at a cost to your self-image. Kids internalize when nobody talks about difficult events. And internalization, well, what do we call depression? It's an internalizing mental health condition. So in my case, Certainly, I have some of the genetic risk from bipolar disorder that my dad and other relatives experienced, but also because no one was allowed to talk about those absences and the chaos in the family, I developed the sense that anything that happened wrong in my life was my fault. We have to stop the silence. We have to open up the dialogue to prevent the internalization. 
Well, I couldn't agree with you more. And it's why today I just went and spoke to a high school auditorium of parents about ending the silence for NAMI and about looking for warning signs and having conversations because I love that what you say about you don't want to internalize this and, you know, we need to talk about it. And I'm going to talk about shame in a second, but I want to go back to your memoir. So your father grew up with Quaker roots under a father who led prohibition, which is really an interesting history. And the irony is that Virgil grew up and loved to make cocktails at parties. I also saw, you know, I love the change of times. And I also saw another irony in your story in that your dad's brother became a psychiatrist to help others, but ended up dying from substance abuse. And I'm wondering if you can just tell us a little bit about that. So dad's older brother, Uncle Bob, Robert Hinshaw, two years older than dad, was 18, about to go off to college when his 16-year-old brother, who'd been missing for the last couple of nights, they heard this commotion on the roof and saw his brother sprawled on the sidewalk beneath the front porch. And this is obviously years before I was born. But he told me once I got to know Uncle Bob that he became convinced that fall that he was going to become an MD and a PhD, a psychologist and a psychiatrist, in order to fight mental illness because he couldn't understand what had happened to his promising younger brother. They were like these in a pod who was muttering about the Nazis and thought he had wings and a jump from the roof. And so Bob became a prestigious psychologist and psychiatrist and helped many people in his career. Yet he, like all the boys in the family and me and my sons, developed migraines, another highly heritable form of illness. And Bob's migraines were bad when he was a boy and when he was a young man. As an MD, he prescribed medicine and prescribed himself painkillers, became addicted to some of them, and ended up dying of kidney failure, secondary substance abuse. So wow. in the same person, a compassionate, brilliant MD, PhD, and someone who died too young because of substance abuse. And we know that depression and bipolar disorder, mood disorders, are often comorbid with, they're linked with substance abuse. So as I grew older, wondering where dad was, and finally my first second semester of college, spring break, my first year of college, learned of some of these experiences because dad decided to disclose, come out of the closet about his mental health issues. But then I learned about many other relatives, both those who'd done well and those who'd succumbed. And it's confusing to be in a family, especially when you're coming of age yourself as a young man to know which side of the fence you were going to end up on. Because the point, Rachel, is when I started these talks with Dad that I had intensely many times a year for the rest of, of his life, because I didn't tell a soul. I didn't go back to Harvard and tell my roommates or girlfriends. They'd think I was flawed. And that's what they thought was schizophrenia. Did I tell professors in my psych courses that I had a dad with severe mental illness? No, I wouldn't be appropriate to go to grad school in clinical psychology. I'd internalized the same shame and silence and stigma that my dad had experienced his whole life. Silence breeds silence, shame breeds shame. And finally, once I started opening up, disclosure breeds disclosure. Oh, I like that. I really do. Disclosure breeds disclosure. And so, you know, you talk about how you were frozen in silence and how so was obviously your mom the poor thing who couldn't, you know, explain to her kids and had to go on as if everything was normal. Do you think that your family was trying to keep up appearances because they were a model academic Midwestern family in the 50s? Or do you just think that, you know, they were ashamed? Or where do you think that silence came from, especially with your mom? Well, this is a $64 billion question. I think C, both of the above. Right. <laughs> Right, right, the doctor's telling them not They're, to talk about it. Yeah. I mean, appearance was everything. Mom taught at Ohio State, too, in English and in history. It was brilliant and wonderful, and so was Dad. But what's the last thing you'd want anyone to know? That the breadwinner of the family, the brilliant Professor Henshaw, had schizophrenia and would occasionally disappear into some of the country's worst mental hospitals. So keeping up appearances was big in the silent 50s. But remember... Dad's lead doctor had forbidden mom and dad from ever mentioning a word of the topic. 
So it was in the very mental health profession, the stigma had been internalized too. So we had a kind of perfect storm, if you will, the cultural norm of silence and the doctor enforced eradication of any mention of the topic. And here I had this great upbringing, you know, we, Dad had 50-yard tickets at Ohio Stadium to watch the Buckeyes play, and we'd go a couple of home games every year, or he'd be gone as though, as I say in one passage in the book, as though aliens had abducted him in the middle of the night. I didn't know where he was, and I couldn't even ask any questions about it. It was confusing as hell, and I internalized. And so when you finally sat down with your dad, you're 18 years old, and he admits what he's been through, how do you feel? Are you relieved? Are you confused? It was the 40 most important minutes of my life. I was stunned. No one had ever talked that openly in our family. I learned from dad about the episode when he thought he had wings and jumped off the roof of the home thinking he could fly to save the world from the Nazis and that he had this lifelong diagnosis of schizophrenia. So I was stunned, A. But B, I thought to myself, the life-changing experiences, something all of a sudden made sense. It must have been something this devastating to have caused that silence in my first 18 years. C, as I left his study and went back up to my room to spend a couple of days back in Columbus before flying back to Cambridge, I've got a mission now. I'm going to change my major to psychology. I've got to learn about schizophrenia or whatever illness dad had. I was even suspicious back then, that first disclosure. He seemed so perfectly normal. How could he have chronic schizophrenia? So all of a sudden, I had a direction in my life. But D, because I didn't tell anybody for years what I was learning from dad, what was my first thought? I'm next. I couldn't sleep through a night in my dorm back at Harvard. If I got too stressed, maybe I'd start hearing voices and maybe I'd end up in some of the snake pits that after realizing, you know, where dad had spent his too many years of his life and where I might spend mine, it's interesting and fascinating and terrifying that some of life's most meaningful experiences, learning about what had really gone on in my first 18 years of life that I didn't know was both liberating because I now had a purpose in life and also terrifying because I thought they would go down the same path. And it took a long time before I felt comfortable enough to really start talking about the topic. And once I got help and once I got into therapy and could find more and more trusted people, I realized that communication is really the solution. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I think that as time goes on and younger people hear this discussion more, I hope that we can really rid that stigma and they can feel more comfortable because as you know, early intervention is key. And so you've said before that bipolar illness is the only mental illness that's statistically associated with an increase in success because of the assets like hyperachievement and high intelligence and creativity. But on the other hand, it has the highest suicide rate and people are more likely to die by suicide when they're manic rather than depressed, which was really interesting. I don't think I had realized that. I guess I had thought that most people, when they're feeling depressed, they die by suicide. And you just mentioned, I mean, we know your father and you are high achieving and your uncles and, you know, there's this fine line between brilliance and madness, like Van Gogh and Elon Musk and Steve Jobs. So my question to you, this is kind of a philosophical question, with gene mapping, would you encourage eradicating bipolar? No. Let me elaborate. So one of the chapters of the book, Another Kind of Madness, is in chapter nine. It's called The Thought Experiment. So I ended up finishing college and running schools and summer camps for kids with developmental disabilities. And I came out to UCLA for grad school. And after my four years of grad school, my internship took place at UCLA Medical Center, the Neuropsychiatric Institute. And I got a placement there at the fairly new Affective Disorders Clinic, one of the West Coast big centers for people with severe depression or bipolar disorder. And the director of the clinic was Kay Redfield Jameson. Young assistant professor, brilliant professor, years before her own memoir, 
an um, unquiet mind, mind about her own bipolar disorder. One day we went into the seminar. There's probably 10 or 15 psychology interns, 10 or 15 psychiatry residents and fellows. And rather than have a case study or an article to focus on, she said, today we're going to do a thought experiment. Now, this was in 1981. This was a long time ago. She said, let's pretend. Now, she said at this point, you know that if in the amniotic fluid, the fetus uh, is going, the embryo or fetus may develop or will develop Down syndrome, we can detect that, and many women choose an abortion. Let's pretend we're some years in the future, and with 100% reliability, we can detect that the child will go on to develop bipolar disorder, not Down syndrome. How many of you would vote if it was you or your partner to abort that fetus or not? Every hand went up in the room except mine and one of my close friends, Jay Wagner, therapist in Pasadena still, still a close friend. 28 out of 30 would elect to abort. And I thought, you people don't know my dad. And Jay, brilliant and family too. And I thought to myself, well, how could this be? Well, the Affective Disorders Clinic back then in the early 80s wasn't just a garden variety clinic for people with depression or bipolar. This was the toughest cases on the West Coast. You'd get referred in tertiary care and hard to treat depressions, hard to treat cases of bipolar disorder would come through the door. And maybe the trainees thought, you know, this is pretty tough going. But then I thought we see him. And now other mood stabilizers can really work. So can family therapy. There's many treatments for severe depression. And Jameson's point was, if we take out of the gene pool people at risk for bipolar disorder, who do we also take out of the gene pool? Their relatives. Who are the most successful people in just about every society? The first degree relatives, the parents or kids or siblings of people with bipolar disorder. You've got some, but not all of the genetic risk. Entrepreneurs, scientists, entertainers, athletes, people who've got some of the liability for bike disorder often turn out to be smashingly successful. If we took out bipolar disorder, we'd take genetic diversity that makes our species attain high things, as well as cases of people with bipolar disorder who do go on to suicide. So be careful what you wish for. Well, I agree. We don't want to eliminate from our gene pool the diversity that makes us succeed. And remember, not just bipolar disorder, but most forms of mental illness today, we don't have cures yet. We got a lot of brain science. We got a lot of psychological science to still fund. But people can get good treatment and recover. If you go to your doctor, Rachel, for a physical health issue compared to a mental health issue, the treatments we now have for mental health conditions give you, on average, a bigger effect than the treatment for your physical health. But that's not the stereotype. The stereotype is what? Mental illness is incurable. You're hopeless. You're going that way and it's the rest of your life. The stereotypes are untrue. Let me clarify one thing you also said at the beginning of your question. When are people at most risk for suicide? Well, depression obviously can lead to hopelessness and suicide. But for people with bipolar disorder, the stereotype is you're either manic or you're depressed. But actually, in most cases, you start off developing a manic episode, and then a few days or weeks in, some despair and hopelessness comes in. But if you still have that manic energy, this is what we call a mixed state or a mixed episode. A very high suicide risk comes in when you've got the hopelessness and despair of depression but still some of that manic energy. So it's not either or, it's both and. Okay, and good. Thank you for that also clarification. a phase of the illness too, in which if it's a pretty severe episode, you lose insight. You think the world is out to get you, or you think you're on top of the world, and you don't recognize that you've got a psychiatric illness. So part of the stigma is what? Not just people being ashamed to admit, we fund the National Cancer Institute per capita at a higher rate than the National Institute of Mental Health because we still don't think mental health issues are real issues. We don't think illnesses are real illnesses. That's how no, It's true. It's something I had to learn. You know, I used to look at my mom's bipolar 
just her behaviors and get so frustrated and upset with her and just want her to like pull herself out of it. And now I realize, because she's still battling it, but doing it so much better, that it's a true disorder that she needs to get a handle on. And it that takes medication. It takes therapy. It's not anything yep. that, you know, it's just like cancer is deserving of research. So is mental health. So I really thank you for your clarification. So I got out of college. I helped dad get a correct diagnosis of bipolar disorder. He got on a skin, remained symptom free for a while. We continued our conversations. I started talking with him more about the family history. She was the unsung hero of the family. My sister, years later, I'm a professor, and dad was starting to fail. Got it. He died of a Parkinson-like illness. And a couple of years before he died, he was in his 70s, we had a chat one evening out in Southern California by a pool out near Palm Springs, where mom and dad had rented a condominium. And he looked at me in the eye. He was starting to have develop a tremor a bit. He said, son, have I ever told you how much I wish I'd had cancer in my life? And I thought to myself, is dad developing an episode? I said, dad, what, what do you possibly, how could you want to have had cancer? And he looked wistful and he looked up into the sky and he said, remember, son, mental illness to a philosopher signifies it's an imaginary. It's just in your mind. Cancer is a real illness. If I'd had cancer, I would have forgiven myself because my illness wouldn't have been imagined. So boy, did I do some soul searching after that. That is so powerful. I had sent dad article after article that I go to the Xerox machine to copy about lithium, bipolar disorder, manic depression. At one level, from middle age on, dad realized that he had this psychiatric illness called bipolar disorder. But at another level, his identity started to form during that first brutal hospitalization for six months when he was 16 and a half going on 17. On the back ward, some of his bunkmates had microcephaly. Today, you'd get that from being born with a mom who had the Zika virus, misshapen heads, et cetera, et cetera. If you've been treated inhumanely and brutally from an early age, no matter what you learn later, that trauma still persists. Early identification, early treatment, evidence-based treatment with compassion, medication and family therapy and individual therapy, we can predict good recovery, but we've got to have the funding and we've got to have the access to care. Yes. Oh my gosh. So true. Okay. So we're going to get talking a little bit about your research, but before that, I just want to talk a little bit more about your memoir because it's so good and it's so powerful. And I think that, you know, you sharing your personal story, that's what people are going to remember. And so, you know, you wrote in this very literary creative way. And I mean, the way you tell stories, it comes through. And I'm just curious you know, this came after all the research and academic writing you did for decades. How did it feel to write in that manner? Well, it was hard. Yeah. (laughs) Right? Yeah. I didn't necessarily want to go back and remember, well, did I know something about that? Did the parents know I was a boy? Did I see any signs of episodes? What about my own struggles once dad made that first disclosure and made that first spring break back from Harvard? My own wondering if I'd end up in a back ward of a hospital. My own, when I couldn't sleep, making myself throw up at night so I could get some sleep and not become psychotic. These are hard things to admit about your family and yourself. But at another level, I knew that if I weren't honest with myself and in telling this story, If I were trying to cover it over, people would know. Honesty breeds honesty. Disclosure breeds disclosure. Disclosure, that's the theme of our talk today. I love it. And the second part of the answer to the question is, I'm a scientist. I write scientific articles or books on psychological topics, and logic and clarity are paramount. But so is memory, and so is narrative, and so is recalling those many the conversation I'd started to have with dad when I was 18. Creative was it, writing. Was it cathartic? This is not, pardon me? Did it feel cathartic? So it went through so many drafts. Yeah. <laughs> this didn't capture it. I got to throw that away and start over again. Thank goodness for word processors where you can yes. not have to throw the page away literally. Yes. <laughs> over time, 
it was recapturing my childhood, recapturing dad's life. Dad was really the co-author of all this because so much of it came from our discussions. It was cathartic. It was healing. It was agonizing. It wasn't until the last stages when I finally got the contract with St. Martin's Press and worked with the wonderful Karen Wolning, my editor, that all of the scenes that I'd learned about my dad's life and the scenes of my own life, I could start to put them together and not just make it chronological, but foreshadow and flash back. That last six months, the whole narrative came together. Years of work finally got, because I think I'd worked it through, finally got to the place where I thought I was doing what I'm doing now with you, telling a story, telling a true life narrative in a way that felt conversational. And for somebody who's an academic psychologist, I had to unlearn some of the writing habits I'd had for many years. Yeah. I mean, I'm right there with you because I'm still working on mine, but my God, it's the most cathartic, but the hardest thing ever. And I yep. just yep. want to applaud you and applaud anyone writing their story because it really is a wonderful legacy to have to pass on to your children so that they can understand, but not just your children, anybody, yep. you know, and your book does that. It expands, you know, across to anyone. So now I just want to quickly touch base on your academic research. And I know that much of your career has been spent doing a lot of research on child and adolescent mental health, that yeah. you've written a book called ADHD, What Everyone Needs to Know, and then another one called ADHD Explosion. And, you know, just the title alone, the ADHD Explosion, you know, can you just tell us, maybe briefly, we'll just talk about this, but what's causing the fast rising diagnosis and so much medication of ADHD? So ADHD is a fascinating condition. It used to be called hyperactivity or hyperkinesis, name change to attention deficit disorder, and then ADHD. And in grad school, I started professors at UCLA and UC Irvine who were very interested in the topic. We know that very similarly to bipolar disorder, the risk for ADHD largely stems from our genes, not our child rear. Mm -hmm. The stereotype is it's just permissive parenting or bad classrooms. So ADHD has a high genetic liability, just the way bipolar disorder does. Yet your family upbringing style and the kind of schooling you get can help shape your outcome. Just in the same way that in for bipolar disorder, which is highly heritable, experiences of abuse and trauma can up the suicide risk the way they did for my dad, whose stepmother abused him, in addition to his genetic liability. So there's lessons to be learned about life and psychopathology from both ADHD and bipolar disorder, in that just because G risk, it doesn't mean that families and classrooms are unimportant. They still are. So ADHD is also interesting because we have medications that can really help reduce the symptoms. But those medications, the stimulants are the main class of medicines used to treat ADHD. They don't really teach you how to read or write or do arithmetic. And they don't really teach you how to do social skills. The best treatments for ADHD are combinations, combining the best medication with family and school and social skills treatments. Just a way for bipolar disorder, mood stabilizing medications can reduce symptoms and actually save your life but you need individual and family therapy to cope. But here we have for ADHD, despite the stereotypes, it occurs at about at the same rate in every country on earth, except in the U.S. and Israel, it's about twice the world average these days. Wow. These are both highly achieving societies. Maybe we're overdiagnosing it mm. compared to the real prevalence of ADHD. So in the book, The ADHD Explosion, my co-author and wonderful colleague, Richard Scheffler, health economist and professor of public health up here at UC Berkeley, we decided to explore why would the diagnosis be so much faster in the U.S. than other countries? And why is more ADHD diagnosed in the south of the U.S. rather than in the far west out here in California and Nevada? Interesting question. It turns out that if you live in a school district that values test scores above all else, called consequential accountability, unless your district's test scores are going up and unless the kids are achieving a certain grade level, 
your school and district get put in the newspaper and you might even lose your funding or go into receivership, those policies are designed to raise children's achievement. They don't have anything to do with ADHD, but we found that if a state suddenly enacts those test scores or bust laws, the poorest kids in that state over the next few years are going to dramatically get overdiagnosed with ADHD, partly because the districts want to get these kids treated to save the test score average, and partly because until it became illegal, you could get a kid diagnosed with ADHD, and guess what? Next spring, that kid's scores didn't count in your school district's mean test score average. Oh, that's interesting. So if they're ADHD, you could game they're the system. Huh. They're special ed kids. So they don't count. That policy changed about 2010. So it turns out that for as biologically based a condition as ADHD is, things like school policy and testing and having test scores mean more than the actual learning, we could get a false boost in ADHD diagnoses. What's the point? Biology is important. Families are important, schools are important, and even public policy about education and testing is important. It's a multi-pronged package that leads to today's ADHD issues. Okay, well, it's clearly very complicated, but that you did a brilliant job explaining that in a short <laughs> amount of time. And I'm sure as a professor, you are seeing kids feeling kind of that pressure to achieve. And I had read a statistic that over a quarter of all college students are using stimulants for academic performance. Are you seeing any of that? I mean, I don't know if you would be, but is there talk of that at Berkeley? So this is a big issue. This is what's called diversion. Diversion is using a medication prescribed for one purpose for another, or actually using your college roommate's ADHD pills for yourself because right. you think it will help you pull an all-nighter for your midterm to do well <laughs> on your term right. paper or what have you, right? Stimulants for ADHD help your focus, reduce your rate of accidental injury, and can help you learn. If you don't have ADHD, stimulants can help you pull the all-nighter, but they fundamentally don't help your learning, and they're also highly addictive the way they're not if you have ADHD. Hmm. So the, the sort of magical thinking that we could make everybody smarter and our country higher achieving by putting stimulants in the water supply, it works for fluoride, for tooth decay, <laughs> it's a bad idea. And we need to do a lot to get our society better educated academically and socio-emotionally, et cetera. But diverting stimulant medications to do that is barking up the wrong tree. But that's an interesting thing to know and to kind of caution our teens that it's highly addictive and that it doesn't necessarily help. So exactly. we're going to kind of wind down, but I love your title, Another Kind of Madness, because it has the word hope, a journey through the stigma and hope of mental illness. And in your words, I would just love to know what hope you found through this process. The hope is. If you don't feel alone as a person grappling with mental health issues, as a family member of somebody grappling with mental health issues, if you can find a connection, if you can find a language, if it's not the greatest mystery. I mean, as a little boy, I thought, I don't know if dad's dead or alive. It must be my fault. And nobody talks about it. It was like this kind of almost fight noise. Once you have a language and once you can connect with other people, I mean, this is the beauty of the mental health advocacy and self-help movement. We know that there's something called self-stigma. If you're a member of a group that receives a lot of prejudice and stigma, we used to think it's inevitable that you'll internalize that stigma. Black power, gay pride, the women's movement. If you identify with your fellow people in that group, that's the antidote. But what's the group until recently you'd never want to be a part of? Other crazy people, other people with learning and neurodevelopmental disorders. Sorry for the stigmatizing language, but that's the reality. If you can form an alliance, bipolar support groups, ADHD support groups, advocacy groups, 
you're now in it with other people fighting for your rights and you're taking control of your life and you're getting treatment, the best stigma reducer we know of is getting evidence-based care. That, along with communication, stops the vicious cycle. Well, thank you so much, because clearly you're hitting it from both sides, <laughs> evidence and personal stories. So thank you. That's right. And if you could write your younger 20-year-old self a love letter, so a Dear Steve letter, what would it say? Oh, boy. I was afraid you'd ask. This is a hard question. <laughs> it's a really important question. I'd say, look, people didn't know enough back then. The medical profession thought mental health issues were too shameful to talk about. It's okay to talk about them. It's okay to feel weak as well as strong. It's okay to be part of a family that does really great things or self-destructive things or everything in between. Talk about it. Forgive yourself and find support and things will look better, Steve. Trust me, they will. That's awesome. I love that. And do you have any habits that you do that bring you happiness? Anything that grounds you? Play full court basketball two or three times a week, despite my that. ailing knees. You'll like do to know. Things. You've got to keep yourself grounded, Rachel. You know that and I know that. Yes. Did you say do things with your family? I was talking over you. I'm so sorry. Yeah, we're both excited about the topic. Basketball, doing <laughs> yes. things with family, taking time out from everybody's under so much pressure to succeed in all ways these days. And, you know, we're a family of some means because I'm a professor and the economic struggles of so many families in this country and around the world. It's a hard life, but it can be a wonderful life if you're connected if you're grounded, and if you've got a purpose. I agree. I agree. And by sharing stories, we connect. And I love that. And I wish you continued happiness and success. But really quickly, can you just tell us where the listeners can find you? And I'll have all of this in the show notes. Uh, Google me, Stephen, that's with a PH, Stephen Hinshaw, www.stephenhinshawauthor.com. Get you in touch with all of my books. The Hinshaw, H-I-N-S-H-A-W, Hinshaw Lab, Google it at UC Berkeley, see what our whole team is doing research on. And it's just so awesome to be able to talk to somebody like you who gets it, who oh, is you. working yourself on telling your and your family's story. And Rachel, you and I both believe in evidence and science. We believe in narrative and storytelling. And it's been a rare pleasure to talk to someone with your dignity and compassion and willingness to communicate. And I hope this discussion has been valuable for everybody who listens in. I so appreciate it. I know it is. And I just, again, wish you all the love and luck and happiness and continued success and, and may your stories and your research go far and wide. And again, thank you. Just want to Give my complete gratitude to somebody like you who's sharing so openly and wish you all the best. Take care. Thank you. And keep me posted as to your own writing. Project. I will. I will. Thank you. Okay. Goodbye, Professor Steve. Thank you. Bye, Rachel. Bye. Thank you. This is Rachel Steinman. For more information or to contact me with any questions, comments, or guest ideas, please check out rightnowrachel.com. That's right with a W. Thank you so much for listening, subscribing, and sharing, dear family. And if you found value in what you've just heard, I would love and so appreciate a great review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Until next time, I wish you love, happiness, and good mental health.